time keeps marching forward, technologies change, and vendors work to keep up. Public Cloud has made its presence known quite heavily over the past couple of years. Join us today as we explore legacy storage in a cloud world. Hello, and welcome to the Explore VM podcast. My guest today has over 25 years in the storage and networking industry. Howard, please introduce yourself. Sure. You know, I'm Howard Marks, and uh, I started in 1981 when there were 300 people in the microcomputer industry because we didn't call it PC yet. Um, but uh, I am now a in storage industry analyst. I've been following the market for you know, the past 15 years strictly in storage and uh, have written for pretty much all the trade magazines at one time or another. All right, so let's dive right into it. Uh, what's new in the world of storage? Anything fun announced in the last uh, couple of weeks, couple of months here? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the biggest fun thing, I think, was Micron's announcement uh, two weeks ago um, that they are producing a tier zero storage appliance. So the, the hot new thing in accessing Flash is a protocol called NVMe, Non-Volatile Memory Express, that has a lot less overhead than the SCSI protocol that everything else that provides storage has been using. Instead of treating a block of flash like it was a really fast SCSI disk, NVMe accepts the fact that flash is memory, not something spinning and partially sequential, so that instead of there being one access queue with 16 entries, there are 64K queues of 64K entries. And what this means is access times down on the order of 20 or 30 microseconds if you're talking from an operating system directly to an NVMe card in that server with 3D crosspoint or DRAM. In terms of flash, it means 150 microseconds or so. But what this new thing from Micron does is it takes those cards, puts them in an external appliance, and uses a new set of protocols um, and software from a startup called Accelero that we were very impressed by at Storage Field Day 12 a couple of months ago. And with the Accelero software and an RDMA network, so 10 or 20, 10, 25 or 100 gig Ethernet with cards that support uh, the Rocky, Rocky RDMA over converged Ethernet version of RDMA, the, an application running in a server can access data in the NVMe cards in this appliance as if it was just accessing its own memory and the latency is about 200 microseconds. That technology has been around about a year. It was really the death knell of Dell's DSSD project because if you can do this all in software, why do you want to spend several million dollars on DSSD's custom hardware? So. I'm a storage guy. Fast is always better. And now Micron, you know, major flash vendor has put their entrepreneur on it. So, you know, we, you don't have to worry about whether the startup that provided part of your system is going to go belly up next week. <laughs> so the title of this episode is Storage in a Cloud World. How are vendors um, adapting to a migration to cloud? Are they integrating with cloud? Um, are there cloud storage options with on-premises storage? Uh, what are we looking at out there? There, you know, there's a lot of solutions uh, because there's a lot of different problems. At at the lowest level, there is no opportunity in the cloud for vendors that make storage as hardware. The closest there is are the programs that some of the major vendors have, where you can put their array in an Equinix or Digital Realty Trust data center that's only a millisecond or so away from AWS. But if you're, the key to your storage system is an ASIC, there's no way to put that ASIC 
into AWS. So what we see now are a couple of things going on. The, ba the, the storage that AWS or Azure or Google provides is really very, you know, what's the technical term, stupid. You get from the compute instance ephemeral virtual disks and you get from something like EBS or Azure Block, block storage, but that block storage doesn't have snapshots, it doesn't have replication, it doesn't have the, the data services that we're used to, and you can only have so much capacity and each instance of EBS can only have so many IOPS and access their, each EBS instance only can talk to one EC2 instance at a time. So things like clustered file systems get layered on top of that. And in fact, in, to some extent, I think places like AWS are where the storage virtualization software that came out 15 years ago from people like Falcon Store and Data Core and new implementations of it from Dell EMC's Scale.io to Wicket.io can layer services on top of that dumb storage and that that might finally be the place where storage virtualization has a purpose. But the real problem is data gravity, that people want to cloud burst. And to date, for most people, cloud bursting's been a dumpster fire because people identify an application and say, we can run this application in the cloud and say it's analytics. I'm gonna take my analytics, I'm gonna move it to the cloud. And they forget that the analytics runs on the data that gets dumped from your production database every night. And that's two petabytes. And you don't have enough bandwidth to move two petabytes of data up to the cloud so that you can run a Hadoop query on it on a nightly basis. So we need to find hybrid solutions that in some way ameliorate that problem. You know, one of the best examples of that is uh, Avere's FXT, which started out as a flash acceleration device for NASs, but now is primarily used for in and out of cloud applications. And it acts as a cache so that only the data that's actually being accessed by the, the analytics engine has to be transferred across your slow pipe. And you really can do some more effective cloud bursting. Now, clearly, on-premises data centers aren't going away. Um, not like you said, there's a lot of dumpster fires out there with cloud burst. So with that being said, what's what's kind of coming forward in data center technology? I know software defined storage and scale out storage are uh, big players in the data center realm. The the biggest change is in the purchase me mechanisms. You know, we're we're leave there's uh, the, we're leaving the I'm going to buy an array every three years and keep it for four years. Um, and spend a year transferring my data on and two years using the data and a year transferring my data off. Um, whether it's scale out systems or just new purchasing models like um, pure storage and TGIL have their programs where when you outgrow your controllers, you can upgrade them for the cost of the difference and every three years if you've been under maintenance, you'll get the system upgraded and all of that happens with the data in place. And now at Dell EMC World this week, they announced a program where you can you know, buy, in air quotes, one of their HCI solutions, whether it's based on vSAN or, or Scale.io or even through the XC series Nutanix, and pay a fixed monthly cost for it for the first year. And in the second year, that fixed monthly cost goes down and in the third year that fixed monthly cost goes down but the significant part is after the first year you can just decide you don't want it anymore and that first year's payment is 
in line with what a year's lease would be, not in line with what the purchase price of the kit would be. So you have a lot of flexibility in things where we used to have to try and get maximum utility and do stupid things like buy storage systems fully populated because at the end of their four-year life, they would still have to have enough capacity to be able to meet new demands. So there's a lot of buzz around HCI. You just mentioned the new Dell EMC offering. Obviously, Nutanix is out there, and HPE has acquired SimpliVity. Is that something that's really gaining a lot of traction? I know here in the upper Midwest market, there's a few places interested, but at the end of the day, they ended up going with uh, traditional three-tiered storage ar- or three-tiered architecture. Well, first, let me object to the term three-tiered. Okay. It it's not three-tiered; it's three-legged. The that the the tier they're not dependent upon each other. They all hold up the application. And and the calling it three-tiered makes it sound like it's got rickety pieces that it really doesn't. <laughs> um, but that aside, it you know you ha- I think that there are natural places for hyperconverged environments. You know, anytime you have environments that don't have operation staff, then being able to have a single hardware device that when one fails, you can ship it and you know just say, okay, see the way that you know move the cape, blue cable one from the dead one to the new one. And that's all you have to tell, we'll talk people through. That's a great advantage. And they're primarily cost effective at that small scale. Um, but I'm not convinced that A, hyperconvergence is the architecture of the future and everything else is stupid, as some vendor blockers would like us to believe, um, nor that it's typically least less expensive or easier to use. Uh, you know, just for an example, if you take, let's take a, an hypothetical all flash array that does data deduplication and compression. That device typically has no nerd knobs on it. You don't set your RAID levels or data protection levels or replication factors or failures to tolerate or whatever you want to call it. It all means the same thing. There's no turn erasure coding on and off. There's no turn dedupe on and off. There's no deciding this workload gets this replication factor and data reduction features turned on because that's how I optimize it. It's a set it and forget it device. And if it supports VVOLs, then it, you run it entirely through the vCenter console and storage and storage policy-based management. And in fact, the user interface, except for the three minutes it takes to make the connection between the VASA provider and your vCenter server, looks exactly the same as it does with vSAN. You're in those same screens. Some of the options are different, but that's a minor change. So... You know, the the running of the system is a 10, 15 percent difference one way or the other. And I couldn't say which way it goes for any given set of systems. And I hear vendors of HCI systems saying, well, yes, you know, we do charge a, a relatively high price, but you'll make it up on OpEx. And if you're running a well-run data center and you've got a cluster of 16 vSphere servers with a dedicated storage array, that takes, what, one full-time employee to run the whole thing? And if it's 10% easier or 50% easier, that's not going to justify a a cost difference greater than that one guy's salary because you're not going to go from one to negative one. You might go from one to zero. And I see you know, sales guys trying to justify price differences well into the hundreds of thousands of dollars with you'll make it up on OPEX. I don't see that there was that much, if it were comparing to a modern system, there's that much OPEX to make up. You know, I'm an analyst. I write reports for vendors for a living. And the one class of reports I will not write is the customer X replaced three racks full of old crap with half a rack of our vendors new stuff. And that's wonderful. 
because if you have three racks full of 10 year old crap, half a rack of modern stuff is going to replace it. It doesn't matter which modern stuff you're buying. And I think it's a misleading type of publication. So, I, I mean, if we oh, go ahead, go ahead. So, I mean, if we go back to the, the storage relationship to the cloud discussion, the most basic, both the, both the most basic cloud service and the most basic way to get into using the cloud is to use an object storage solution like S3 as your ultimate destination. Uh, most backup applications today will write data to S3 just as to S3 compliant object storage, which could be on premises or re literally S3. And so we can eliminate and should for you know, pretty much anybody listening, if you if tape is a good idea for you, you probably know who you are, but we can eliminate the copying from disk to tape and having the Iron Mountain guy come with storing data as data up in the cloud. Um, be careful, however, when you start looking at the available services about your access times. Uh, I have had a couple of people that I've spoken to who um, had organizations that decided that they were going to back up not to Amazon's S3, but to Amazon's long-term storage solution, Glacier. And what they did not anticipate was that they would have to do a full server restore because not only does Glacier have a SLA that says that when you request your data, it may take several hours for us to deliver it, but there's also a very large egress charge if you access more than 25% of your data. So that while their monthly bill for storing the data in Glacier was 30 or $40, the restore bill was to over 2000 because the egress charges were substantially more than the total cost. And in retrospect, they would have decided to store in S3, which costs more a month, but doesn't carry those uh, incredible charges. The, the other thing is if users are building their own EC2 instances, that they should look very closely at um, flash caching solutions because you can use a lower cost tier of EBS, which you pay for all the time, if you use the ephemeral flash that comes with an EC2 instance as a cache, you can make that run much faster and not have to pay for the all flash EBS instance for those burst applications where you really are just using them intermittently. You know, the, while everybody is interested in moving everything to the cloud, the truth is that it's the intermittent use cases that have the best uh, return on investment. In moving your servers to the cloud, you may discover because the cloud is quoted in dollars per hour, not dollars per year, that math becomes your worst enemy. Yeah, it's it's surprising to me how many people out there, when they try to design or set up their cloud solution, forget about getting the data back. Not only how long that takes, but the cost that goes with it. I wouldn't right. say it's, it's a hidden cost, but it's not something on the forefront of the people trying to sell it or market it. I mean, even even at, in the early days of online backup, when you know solutions like Backblaze, you know people go, well, yeah, it'll take a month to make the initial backup, but after that, it's incremental, so we don't need more internet bandwidth. It's like, yeah, and you're fine for the daily restores too. But when that server actually ups and dies because you don't have any administrators and the first disk in the RAID set failed and then the second disk in the RAID set failed and then the third disk in the RAID set failed and now you're not working at all, uh, you're going to have to order the send me my data back on a USB hard drive option. And that takes a couple of days, not a couple of minutes. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to take a brief moment to make an open call for guests. 
Great content comes from those who are willing to share and help others. If you've got a passion for anything tech, have a great new product, or came up with a way to solve a complex problem, contact me. I'd love to have you on as a guest. Let's keep the Explore VM podcast train moving along. And let's be honest, no one wants to hear me talk to myself. Now, back to the conversation. Now, you've mentioned a couple of times um, backups to online or backups to the cloud. Um, are, what, what vendors are really doing that well right now? Well, it kind of depends. It's more important that your backup application treats your applications well. Um, and it is desirable that your backup applications do data reduction because you're paying per gigabyte per month. Um, so some applications like, you know, the mainline applications you were thinking of using within the data center, everything from um, net backup to networker to Veeam to Commvault, uh, they'll all do a backup, a copy, an existing backup to the object store. And so they're really envisioning that the entire data path is I'm making a backup within the data center and then the copy to the data store is the equivalent of having the Iron Mountain van come and pick up the tapes, that that's tertiary storage. Uh, there are some new vendors like Cloudberry that whose systems are designed strictly for backing up to object storage, whether it be public cloud or in-house. So I'm pushing the backup vendors to improve their backup to object storage functionality because I think object storage for large organizations should become the primary storage repository. You know, during my career, we've gone from tape backup being essentially one word to disk to disk to tape to dedicated storage appliances like data domains. And now we're making the transition to object storage. And a big part of that is because we finished the transition for back, from backing up to tape to backing up to disk for at least a decade. Even though every backup application had a backup to disk function, those backup to disk functions treated disk like tape. Instead of creating, instead of writing to a tape cartridge, they wrote to a file. And then they used each file in all of the logic that was built into the product for the past 20 years to manage tapes. And that meant that we were still stuck in the weekly, full, daily, incremental model of backups. And Data Domain was created for that model, and that model creates a lot of duplicates. But we made those backups that way because we were backing up to tape and making a monthly full backup and daily incrementals meant if a server crashed on the 23rd, we had to back up from 24 different tapes, and you would usually lose one of them. Today, we move, we've mostly moved to a an incremental forever model. And if we're backing up vSphere, those incrementals are change block tracking incrementals, not file-based incrementals. And what both of those changes mean is there's fewer and fewer duplicates in the stream of data your backup application is sending to its repository, which makes the 10 times cost difference between a data domain and an object store not worth it because you won't get 10 times data reduction anymore. So I, I'm really trying to move that paradigm to backup direct to object storage. And ev all the major vendors have either gotten there or have it as the it's in the next version roadmap item. Well, that's good to hear because the quantity of uh, clients I work with that don't have an off-site uh, storage location for their backups is, I, I would say, scary. Sure, you're you're doing the right thing by creating backups, but if you don't have them someplace other than your data center, what, what good are they? I I had an SMB client many years ago, was burglarized, and the backup tapes were kept in the safe. And they stole the server and the safe. <laughs> that's uh, that's not going to be a good next morning. Uh, no, that was not a good next morning. 
<laughs> so shifting gears a little bit here, are we at the point that the cost of all flash versus like a hybrid solution of flash and spinning disk, uh, is it more in line with what traditional storage costs are, or is it still too pricey for places to go all flash? Well, I mean, it depends what you mean by places. Um, my friends and I joke that enterprise IT only gives lip service to actual cost. And, and in many ways, it's true. Um, but when you start getting into the SME and SMB realm, then the actual cost matters quite a bit more. You, the, the sad fact is we are in a flash shortage today, and I expect that we will be for the next 18 months or so. And SSD prices are actually rising. So while two years ago um, some people were predicting that disk was dead, it, it's not happening for a while. Um, I'm seeing a lot of customers still using hybrid solutions when you really only, you know, basically if your data center really only has one disk array, a hybrid is probably still the best solution for you. Um, as you grow, then you start reaching the, I would rather pay two or three times as much to go all flash with data reduction uh, so that I never have to deal with inconsistent performance. Uh, but if your IT budget is uh, in the single digit millions, then that's unlikely. All right, Howard. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, where can people find you online? Um, so I tweet from the handle at deep storage net. Uh, you can find me on a lot of the tech and storage field day videos. Uh, I write um, for tech target most of the time nowadays, having recently switched from network computing. Um, but that means pretty much all of their sites. So sometimes it's search SSD and sometimes it's search storage. And uh, the deep storage lab site is uh, deepstorage.net. All right. Well, once again, thank you very much. Oh, it's always a pleasure. I like to babble on. <laughs> and thank you for listening. As always, to join the conversation on today's topic or to be a guest on an upcoming episode of the Explore VM podcast, reach out to me on Twitter at ExploreVM, Facebook, or email me at paulexplorevm.com. Once again, thank you for listening.